Hi, uh, welcome to Colorado State University's President's Lecture Series, Community Lecture Series. I'm Rick Miranda, I'm the Provost and Executive Vice President here at Colorado State. And uh, President Frank uh, created this uh, President's Community Lecture Series about five years ago, five, six years ago, to offer an expanded opportunity for people in Fort Collins and Northern Colorado communities to hear from some of CSU's most engaged and engaging scholars. And we've had some fantastic conversations over the years. I've been to many of them myself in the audience. Bill Ritter, former governor, now uh, directs our energy, uh, one of our energy centers, Diana Wall, just elected to the National Academy, Temple Grandin, you know, Steve Withrow, Laurie Peak, Jay Menon, is lecture Brian Wilson, who directs the Energy Institute, Amy Prieto, working on battery technology, Robin Reed, Joel Bacon, our organist, who's uh, on the other side of campus at a, uh, playing the organ right now tonight, <laughs> and Wayne McElwraith have all uh, given uh, one of these presidential community lecture series. I'm just delighted to see the, the room filled tonight. Unfortunately, President Frank had an unexpected conflict which just arose very suddenly uh, uh, earlier this week, and so he couldn't be here tonight. So it, it, we're gonna rename it the Provost Community Lecture Series. Don't <laughs> From, but anyway, it's my honor to be here and to uh, uh, host and, and introduce this evening's special guest. Tonight's speaker is, is Dr. Chris Fisher, Professor of Anthropology here at Colorado State. And um, you, know, I, you know, you take a look at this picture and I've been told that anthropology is a very exciting uh, thing to do. Now, I'm a mathematics professor, so if you, if you like you know, hacking through dense jungles infested with deadly snakes and crocodiles and jaguars and finding lost civilizations. I mean, if you like the kind of thing that, that Chris has done, okay, that's fine. But, you know, for me, going into my office, shutting the door and staring at the equations on the whiteboard for a couple of hours, that's what's really exciting. So, now, if, uh, but, you know, whatever floats your boat, so... Uh, Chris has been, uh, you know, explores, his work explores the connections between human societies and environments through a variety of archaeological and earth science methodologies, including geoarchaeology, full coverage surveys, excavation, remote sensing techniques that we'll hear more about tonight. He's been featured in National Geographic and the New York Times bestselling Lost City of the Monkey God, uh, uh, book written where he's, his work has been featured. Uh, came out last year using a radar system called LIDAR. I'm sure we'll hear more about it tonight. In his research in Mexico and Honduras, Chris was able to map, map architectural structures that may never have been discovered otherwise. So pioneering a really a fantastic new technique. He's found large and previously unknown cities and uncovered artifacts hidden from sight for centuries. Truly amazing revelations. And moreover, what makes Chris a, really a true CSU Ram is his willingness to try a new approach to solve these old problems of, of archaeology and anthropology. Chris wasn't content to spend his career working just one site using old methods. He knew that taking an innovative idea could pay off when he used LIDAR's 3D modeling abilities to map an area that yielded just incredible findings. And he knew there was a better way and he, looked, he took a calculated risk to go try it, and it worked. And one last thing that makes us incredibly proud of, proud of Chris, he's a first-generation college student, enrolled as a percussion performance major originally, and then discovered his passion for archaeology. And why aren't you on the other side of campus playing with, <laughs> with Joel Bacon? He's held academic positions at Arizona State University and Kent State University before joining us here at Colorado State, and we're very lucky to have him. Please welcome tonight's speaker, the archeologist, Dr. Chris Fisher. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for, thank you, uh, Rick, and to the president, and uh, thanks everybody for, for coming out on this, uh, beautiful evening. I can't believe anybody's here, actually, I'm not outside. Um, for those of you that have read Doug's book, this is actually T3. 
Uh, the city of the Jaguar is located in T1. This is a picture from T3. We did get into T3. Um, it took us about, I don't know, maybe an hour to go 300 meters in this uh, vegetation. So T3 is the, is the location of a city that's probably even bigger than the city of the Jaguar. But it's so rugged and so nasty and um, so impassable that I'm not convinced that anybody will ever investigate it. Um, certainly not me. And I also want to point out that here at T3, walking in this very area, the Honduran military went back several months after we excavated in 2016 to T3 to try to investigate it a little further. And right in this same area where I'm walking uh, now, a crocodile came charging out of this grass and grabbed a soldier by his arm. And apparently, they t what they told me was it was a small crocodile. So they were able to beat it off with their, the butts of their guns, and the soldier was OK, and they continued on their way. Now, I just want to make it clear that I wouldn't have been walking through here had I known that <laughs> the potentially there were crocodiles in there. Nobody told me that. Uh, I also want to mention that we have just started a um, new center for archaeology and remote sensing. We're in the process of starting it. It'll be housed in the anthropology department um, in the College of Liberal Arts. And so if you're interested, please stop by and We'll pull up some really cool stuff for you on the, on the computer. And of course, I also want to mention this book for, for some of you that, how many people have actually read Doug's book? Oh wow, a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> well, as you know, I mentioned in, in Doug's book, Lost City, the Monkey God, a true story. So if you haven't picked it up or haven't seen it, I definitely encourage you to do that. I think it's a pretty good read. Now in the 21st century, we're supposed to give these talks as if they're TED Talks. And that's what I'm going to do. And following the TED Talk formula, you are supposed to begin your talk with a personal, captivating story that captures the audience. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so I normally work in Mexico, and I work in the Lake Pátzcuaro Basin, which at the time of European contact was the core of an empire that was much like the Aztec Empire. It's a heavily, pretty tra heavily trafficked area. It's densely settled today. It's a major tourist zone. Working in the Pátzcuaro Basin, you would expect to find lots of little sites that nobody recorded or bothered with, but you wouldn't expect to find any big sites. Using World War I technology, uh, updated with GPS units and using ArcGIS and other kinds of things, we were performing traditional archaeological survey in 2009 walking across the landscape, transects of people, lines of people, recording all of the sites that we saw, we encountered a very large settlement, much larger than we expected, much larger than was supposed to be there um, using, uh, based on current models. My graduate students convinced me that I needed to find an edge of this place, which we now call Angamuco. So one afternoon, I grabbed a couple power bars, some water. I turned off my radio so the graduate students wouldn't be able to get in contact with me. And I walked across the landform that this city occupies. It occupies kind of a geologically a recent lava flow known locally as a mal pais or a badland. I walked for about an hour and a half across this landform. I got to the other side, and I was like, huh. There were building foundations all the way across on my little walk across, uh, across this small pais. Huh, this is a city. Oh no, it's a city. <laughs> so I meandered back and I got back and talked to the graduate students and I'm like, well, it, it covers the entire small pais. We thought at that point it was about 10 square kilometers. We now know it's 26 square kilometers. And I was like, well, this is a city. And they were like, oh my god, it's a city. Oh, that's great. And they're like, why aren't you excited? And I'm like, you guys don't understand. <laughs> this ups the ante for everything. Before, we were just doing our thing. We'd go spend our summers in Mexico and survey. Now everybody's watching, because the city isn't supposed to be there. And that's exactly what has happened. 
Um, after surveying Angamuco for a, a couple of field seasons, I realized that I could be doing this for the rest of my career. I'm impatient, so I walked down the hall to a colleague of mine, Steve Lees, who's somewhere in the audience here. Um, Steve's a geographer, but he's in the anthropology department. We allow some geographers to exist in our anthropology department. And uh, he's like, have you, have you heard of this technique called LIDAR? And I'm like, no, what's that? And he's like, you should try it. So I had a little bit of money left in my NSF grant. We got LIDAR for Angamuco. We tried it. We got it back. It was just a cloud of points. I'm like, Steve, what in the hell am I supposed to do with this stuff? What, are we, what is this even? That's it. We wasted our money. I'm never going to get another NSF again. I'm going to be drummed out of the business. We worked with the data. We taught ourselves how to use the data. We got our first hill shade. We started making these kinds of animations. And I was blown away. And I realized that that first LiDAR scan, we now have two for Angamuco, saved me well over a decade of traditional archaeological field work in 45 minutes of flying. 45 minutes of flying. Completely transformed my project, completely transformed the arc of my career, and probably ruined my life. No, 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 it probably improved my life. <laughs> so this is, actually what the, this is actually one of the central areas for Mangamuko. You can see that circle and square. That's a very large pyramid. It's about 30 meters on one side, all embedded within a completely human-modified landscape. I estimate that at Angamuco, there are about 50,000 building foundations that cover 26 square kilometers. It's the same number of building foundations on the island of Manhattan. Now, of course, on Manhattan, there are in excess of 1.6 million people. The maximum number of people that occupied Angamuco at any one time was something on the order of 100,000 people. So most of those building foundations represent single dwellings, how, normal houses. They're not the skyscrapers that you see in Manhattan. But nonetheless, it's an incredible number of buildings. So what is light detection? So what is LIDAR? What is light detection and ranging? It basically operates on the principle of light. It is like sonar for the ground. Using some kind of aircraft, could be a helicopter, could be a fixed wing aircraft. Increasingly, it's, it's becoming drones, and it will be drones in the future. You have an instrument on that aircraft. It fires a, gr a dense grid of infrared beams down to the Earth's surface. That grid of beams is so dense that no matter what the canopy, and the canopy in Honduras that we're about to talk about here in one second, is arguably the densest vegetation that you get in the world. It's as dense as the Amazon, 50 meter canopy. No matter how dense that, that vegetation is, some of those beams will penetrate down to the Earth's surface. When they strike an object on the Earth, it could be the Earth's surface, could be a bird, could be a leaf, could be the top of a tree, could be the back of an archaeologist walking through the forest returns to a sensor on the aircraft. It gives you a measure of distance. Put all of that together, it creates a cloud of points. It's not a photograph. It's a three-dimensional object. By digitally filtering away that vegetation, we can see things on the Earth's surface with a really high resolution. In, at Angamuco, we can see things that are about the size of an ordinary construction brick. In Honduras, the, the, because the veg vegetation is more dense, the resolution is not quite, quite that high. These LIDAR records are the ultimate conservation records. They record the Earth's surface and everything on the Earth's surface in a high resolution. All of that, those data that I work so hard to digitally remove are the careers of many other scientists that study tree composition, forest composition, tree density, hydrology, topo top uh, topology, the geology, et cetera. And in that sense, these, these, so these LIDAR records, these conservation records, are critical to help us understand the impacts of global warming.
And that's, where, that's really where, where, where this, this story starts. This is what I would call the conundrum of the 21st century. We have so much left to discover, but never before is our cultural, has our cultural and ecological patrimony been so threatened. We're experiencing massive earth system change due to urbanization, global warming, mining, deforestation, migration, etc. We are losing a battle that we're ill-equipped to fight, especially archaeologists. I mean, let's face it, archaeologists are not fighters, we're lovers. LIDAR and the tools that will follow are just uh, one of many things that will allow us to document our disappearing world for posterity. In this sense, archaeology has finally reached its age of discovery. Our work at Angamuco got a lot of press, and it came to the attention of a couple of filmmakers Steve Elkins and Bill Benenson and Tom Weinberg. They had just flown LIDAR for three river valleys in northeastern Honduras. They were looking for a legendary lost city that didn't exist because it's legendary. Uh, <laughs> but they did document some significant archaeology. Human features were visible in the data, but they were having trouble interpreting it. They'd never interpreted archaeological LIDAR before, and frankly, there really aren't that many people that are still interpreting archaeological LIDAR. I talked to Steve Elkins several times on the phone. Steve came to the CSU campus, showed Steve Lees and I the data. Um, I said, you know, obviously you've got these features here, but it's all embedded within a human-modified landscape. There was a lot more things that were visible to Steve and I because we had, you know, been working with the Angamuco data for so long. Steve Elkins said, well, why don't you guys, you know, join the project? I'm like, I don't know, I'm really busy, and I have a family. You know, I live in Colorado, there's lots, like not lots of nice stuff going on, and okay, I'll do it. <laughs> Honduras is a really dangerous place. It's the original banana republic. It's always been contested. It's always been on the edge of collapse since the first Spaniards arrived in the 1520s. The country's rugged, much of it's inaccessible, and it's always been a, pirate, a haven for pirates, smugglers, malcontents. It's possibly why I did so well there, I guess. Um, it's the center of narco-trafficking in Central America. There's a, a significant political unrest. We just had a, 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 a democratically sanctioned coup exactly know how to phrase what just happened there in Honduras last year. Um, it has the highest murder rate in the world, high poverty, migration, etc. There are constant attempts on the lives of government officials. Is there anybody from risk, risk management in the room? <laughs> oh, no. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to say what the next thing I want to say. <laughs> um, The most remote place in Central America is the Mosquitia Tropical Forest of, uh, zone of northeastern Honduras and Nicaragua. Mosquitia refers to the musketeers of the 19th century. There are plenty of mosquitoes there, uh, but that's not what it's named after. And I should also point out that having grown up in northern Minnesota, I can tell you that the mosquitoes there are much worse than they were uh, in the Mosquitia rainforest. <laughs> Which, uh, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> largest remaining contiguous zone of old growth tropical forest left in Central America. It's often called the Little Amazon, the jewel of Honduras. Many unknown species of plants and animals. It's critically important ecologically. And it pains me to say it, but the ecology is potentially more important than the archaeology. And in that sense, we used archaeology as bait to help save our rainforest. The Mosquitia has many international protections. It's a UN biosphere, et cetera. There's zero resources to be able to impl implement any of that sort of stuff. Um, it is experiencing incredible deforestation. 
most of it for cattle raising. They clear places, they run beef on them for a few years, and then they just leave it, they just let it go. Uh, most of that beef is sold in the United States for fast food. There were buyers there from McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell. This image is not very clear, but if you look up at the top of the screen, you can see smoke. That is the nearest deforestation. We've just taken off in a helicopter from the city of the Jaguar. That is, that's how close the deforestation is to T1, to the T1 Valley, to the city of the Jaguar. This is deforestation from, again, from the helicopter. Um, this is very recent deforestation. You can see how steep the topography is, how devastating removing that vegetation is. When you fly over these things, it's so sad. It really is like they just took a giant slice out of the side of the forest. You can just look in to that forest. You can't reforest these areas. When you reforest them, they turn into something else. It, once you remove this, this tropical forest, it's gone forever. There's no going back. Due to the ruggedness of the area, we don't really know about the, a, a lot about the, the prehistory of the zone. It enters a debate um, generally regarding how heavily occupied tropical regions such as Amazonia actually were. We now know that there were millions and millions and millions of people in these areas at the time of European contact. And I'm one of a handful of people that believes that most of the tropical forested areas of the Americas are really nothing more than abandoned gardens. And there's no reason to assume the Mosquitia is any different and we can actually demonstrate that. There is a long history of adventuring in the area. It was supposed to be the location of a legendary city called Ciudad Blanca or later conflated with the lost city, the monkey god. Um, much of that is uh, a complete scam, as was demonstrated, a fraud, as was demonstrated in Doug's book. Um, I, the adventuring stuff, I'm a scientist, I'm an archaeologist. The adventuring stuff, frankly, bores me to tears. But if people are interested, I have a couple slides that I can show you at the, in the discussion period. The LIDAR data for the Mosquitia clearly shows two cities embedded within a completely human modified landscape. One of those cities is about six square kilometers, that's T3. One of those cities is about five square kilometers, that's T1, the city of the Jaguar. City of the Jaguar is oriented around 10 very large plazas with earthen mounds around them and then hundreds of um, houses and terraces and other features around those things. Our initial findings were released to the media at the request of the Honduran government. Honduras is desperate for, for uh, positive news. Um, it went around the internet, I think, about 20 times. Um, we got incredible press and attention for it. Um, there was an article in the New Yorker. Um, there were articles in the New York Times, et cetera. Um, there was also significant backlash and criticism. People said that it wasn't possible to see what we were seeing, that we were just making it up. LIDAR can't penetrate a, a canopy that, that, is, that is that dense. That what we were actually seeing were interpreting as human-generated features, were geological features. Um, these sorts of occupations weren't possible in a tropical uh, rainforest. Um, that I was really just a treasure hunter, which is possibly the most uh, heinous insult that you can level at an academic archaeologist. Um, <laughs> and, and honestly, if I'm a treasure hunter, I'm like the worst treasure hunter ever. <laughs> just come look at my yard sometime. <laughs> so um, it was decided that we needed to fill verify the results. Sponsored by Bill Benison in 2015, we actually uh, went to one of those places, T1, which we now call the city of the Jaguar. 
was a logistical nightmare. Um, it was accessible only by helicopter. And we had to bring in a helicopter from San Diego, actually. Um, we didn't even know if we were going to be able to land the helicopter, so I was trained to rappel out of a helicopter. Uh, thank God I, would, I didn't have to do that. Um, incredibly dangerous environment. Um, we used an old CIA base, air base called El Aguacate to, to, it's a forward operating base to get us into the jungle. And when we got there, it was truly incredible. Um, and I'm going to turn some of this There was absolutely no evidence or sign of humans. It's the only place I've ever been globally where there was no plastic. Animals had no experience with humans. We saw red brocket deer, monkeys, beards, tapirs, bellbirds, evidence of big cats, jaguars, um, tapirs, which I now, and, and peccaries, which I now know were white, are white-lipped peccaries, but at the time I wouldn't have known the difference between a white-lipped, a red-lipped, a black-lipped peccary, but um, they're white-lipped peccaries, which apparently are incredibly rare, and lots of incredible snakes. On the field, we saw exactly what we saw on the LIDAR and more. It was a one-to-one -one correlation between what we were interpreting as human features and what we were actually seeing, plus a lot of other things that um, weren't visible in the LIDAR data because of the resolution. At the center of the city was a cache of objects, 42 objects that we could see on the surface. We now know that there are a lot of more objects there. And here I am yelling at everybody not to touch anything. My one moment where I'm a martyr for science, I guess. Uh, <laughs> there were 42 objects on the surface. They were groundstone objects, probably left there um, as an as a offering to ritually close the city. They'd lay in there for centuries, possibly since the city was abandoned, we think sometime in the 1530s. They are seats of power arranged around powerful objects. Again, kind of a ritual closure, a ritual ceremony when the city was abandoned. Our results, again, were um, released to the media. Uh, it was kind of a, uh, and it went around the internet another 20 times. Uh, along with the backlash, there was an article in um, National Geographic magazine detailing the, uh, uh, the discovery. Uh, many other articles, video, an Explore episode on National Geographic. Now, based on this work, there's a whole bunch of other crazy, there's a uh, boutique chocolate bar, there's a video game, two best-selling books, a documentary, an Explore episode, um, and a whole bunch of other crazy stuff, all from this, <laughs> this one, uh, this one uh, expedition. As part of the National Geographic, article, we got the full treatment, which included a reconstruction. And before this, I'd never really thought about these reconstructions or how they were done. I thought, oh, they give the artist a bottle of wine, and he goes to his DC loft for the evening, and then he comes back with a hangover, and he's got the reconstruction. That's not how it works. We went back and forth with these folks for months and months, and this is the only reconstruction I know of that is based entirely on LIDAR. And here it is. This is actually a reconstruction of the center of the city of the Jaguar. And in the process of doing a reconstruction, you immediately see things that are wrong. That's the power of these reconstructions, is it allows you to understand what you know and what you don't know. And um, that's exactly what this exercise taught me, at least. A bigger issue was, what do we do about the objects? They were in um, danger of uh, being looted. And we knew that we had a moral and ethical responsibility to go back and make sure that those objects that were most in danger of being looted were shepherded to safety and that the rest of the deposit was stabilized and protected and that this was done in a scientific manner. The Hondurans wanted to remove some of the objects for safekeeping immediately, 
and there was a, a, a big debate about that um, possibility. And finally, the archaeolog other archaeologists, the Honduran archaeologists and myself said that you will not remove these objects. You know, they won't be removed over uh, sort of our um, dead bodies, which was not unlikely, given the sorry risk management. But, um, um, so uh, over a six-month period in 2015, I put together almost half a million dollars in National Geographic and Honduran support, along with significant Honduran support from the Honduran military to go back and um, continue our work at um, the city of the Jaguar, focused on um, protecting the, the objects from the cache. In the meantime, the Honduran president, who was deeply uh, involved in the excavation and the work, um, and he actually, the, uh, the president has visited the site, I think, five times now, six times, um, left a group of soldiers at the site to guard the objects. So our goals for 2016 were very simple, not to excavate all of the materials from the cache, but just remove those objects most in danger and stabilize the rest of the cache. Unfortunately, we were too late. In that six month period, some of the objects were removed, they were brought back, and the cache was disturbed, a lot of the cache was disturbed. This had to have been done by the Honduran military, possibly to embarrass the president, we're not entirely sure, we're not entirely sure what happened, possibly I don't wanna know, because we did find, when we excavated the cache, a lot of shell casings and other recent stuff that indi indicated that there might have been actually some conflict <laughs> up at the cache location. Um, but in 2016, we returned uh, to the cache location. We used Honduran helicopters, which was done at the request of the Honduran government. Um, they were from Vietnam. They were used in Vietnam. They were low, slow, and dangerous. And as is mentioned in Doug's book, uh, a door flew off one of the helicopters in flight uh, on, one of the, on one of the flights back. Sorry, so I probably shouldn't tell you. Um, we brought along, I brought along a team of ex-students and SAS personnel to help run the camp and protect everyone. Um, it was an absolute logistical nightmare. The field laboratory was separated from the excavation. All of the material, everybody and all of the uh, logistical equipment had to be brought in by helicopter. Everything had to come out by helicopter, including the artifacts. Um, so it was really, really, uh, I, I actually didn't spend much time excavating. Most of my time was spent on the satellite phone, arguing with the Hondurans about various stuff, uh, and trying to make sure we had water and food and the things that we needed, and then figuring out how to get the artifacts back. So I'm about to show you just a snippet of a National Geographic did film while we were in there. Um, this is kind of the lost footage. I'll show you just a snippet from the 2016 excavation. So from the cache location, we were actually able to remove about 400 stone ceramic and other objects systematically. Um, they're all, uh, uh, there's a spatial organization to the cache. They're all organized around cr critical central objects. Um, it was, uh, uh, everything was documented by the president's office, by Honduran military, by ourselves. It was like doing archaeology uh, in a, in sort of a fishbowl. Um, it was also a bit of a logistical nightmare. Um, as I mentioned before, everything had to be hauled in and out, um, including tents, et cetera, all of our food and gear. Um, and if you're wondering how many Honduran soldiers it takes to set up a giant REI tent, it's like eight, plus two pilots to tell them what they're doing wrong. <laughs> One of the big tasks that I faced was how to get the objects down off of this big hill that they were on, down across the river and into the helicopter, and that fall, I had just prepared this lecture for my archaeology of death class, or archaeology of death class. 
um, which I taught that spring. And I had done a lecture about uh, Howard Carter and King Tut's tomb. And I had remembered seeing these um, uh, devices that he used, these carriers that he had made. This is actually one of the, the wheels from the, from the chariot in Tutankhamun's tomb. Uh, these uh, bearer things that he had made. And so I had um, the soldiers make a bunch of them. And that's actually how we got the artifacts down off of the hill. We used these Rubbermaid action packers. I tried to get them to spray paint them gold so they look like the Ark of the Covenant from the first Indiana Jones movie. But that part, the translation didn't, uh, the translation didn't get there. And then everything was actually flowing out. Um, I have one last little video here that shows um, the lab and a lot of the artifacts. We curated everything, washed it, prepped it, um, stabilized it, um, basically set it up as if it was a museum, and they've now turned this area into a museum. Fully documented and conserved everything from the cache. Um, and then everything was formally turned over to the Honduran government. And it's all, right now, it's all in, under the, uh, the protection of the president's office and of the military in a special museum facility that um, they've actually uh, constructed at, um, uh, at El Aguacate, the uh, ex-CIA air base. Is that a tornado? <laughs> Um, and here you can actually see one of the presidential visits to come and actually um, see, the, uh, see the objects. Um, the president visited the site four or five times when I was there. Several other times that's the president ex exiting the, his uh, aircraft. The president's very fond of these Columbia fishing shirts. He wears them everywhere. And that means every, every politician in Honduras also wears a Columbia fishing shirt. <laughs> So anytime you see somebody with a Columbia fishing shirt, you know that they're some sort of um, Honduran emulating, emulating the, the president, and they're some sort of Honduran uh, person. Why was the city abandoned? Probably due to European-introduced disease. We now know that nine out of every 10 people in the Americas, indigenous folks in the Americas, perish from European-introduced disease in the first 50 years or so of conquest. This is an event that we don't even have an analogy for. Um, it's so much severe, say, for example, the Black Death of Europe. So for, to, to, to get it for, you know, to get a, the proper analogy for this event, you really, we have to, it, it's a Stephen King, the stand event. You have to turn to science fiction. You know, I'm supposedly, I'm an expert. I don't consider myself to be an expert in anything, but I can't wrap my head around the severity of this, um, of this event. It was so fundamental to, um, what happened in the Americas. We also conserved the site, covered it with um, uh, gravel and stone to preserve it. Um, the president implemented all sorts of protections based on our work for the, uh, for the Mosquitia rainforest. He's also set up a corps of soldiers. They're known as the Jaguar soldiers to uh, protect the forest. They've implemented reforestation programs. And they've also implemented programs that are aimed at halting deforestation. So in a very real sense, archaeology actually helped save a rainforest. We don't know how, for how long, <laughs> but at least it, it you know, worked for a little while. Um, And here, here's uh, uh, several times I had to meet the president and go and, um, to events at the National Palace. One of these events was in conjunction with the October uh, 2015 National Geographic article. I didn't want to go empty-handed. So, you know, we figured out what we could. So I got a ram statue. <laughs> I had the anthropology department buy a ram statue. And I had the, the front of it engraved. And they're like, what do you, you know, usually we put stuff on here. And I'm like, well, put, we need to put the president's name. And then, well, usually it's an award for something. I'm like, okay, well, uh, it's the annual Colorado State University Latin American Conservation Award. 
which, which I just made up to put to put on to have something to put on the plaque. So they put that on the plaque, and I went and I and I picked it up down at the trophy shop downtown, and I looked at it, and I, everything was planned perfectly. I had just enough time to get to DIA, and get on my flight and go to Honduras, and, and put this thing in my luggage, right, my check. So I look at the plaque, and they've misspelled the president's name. I'm like, oh my God. Luckily, they were able to fix it right then. But you know, it screwed up, so I had to carry this on the flight. So TSA made me take the bottom of the trophy apart because they wanted to make sure it wasn't packed with explosives. So this, this photo appears in source, and that's all great. And then it, somebody read the plaque on there, and I got a couple people asking me about what the nomination process was <laughs> for, the, it's for the CSU Council. <laughs> People have continued to go to the people have continued to go to the T1 location, and this is just hot off the press. This is just out in the New Yorker. Doug Preston wrote another article. Uh, uh, Benenson actually sponsored, paid for Conservation International to go in and do a rapid ecological assessment um, at the location, and we were criticized by a lot of ecologists for saying that. We saw jaguars in there, uh, that we saw tapirs, that peccaries were running around under our hammocks, um, that, you know, that we saw all this amazing wildlife, that, that the monkeys were so fearless and they looked so different from the other monkeys that I was kind of familiar with seeing. Um, I mean, I, I'm an, I'm an anthropologist. I have had to look at monkeys a, a few times in my career, um, et, et cetera. They said that places like that just don't exist. They don't exist in Honduras. We were making stuff up. We weren't seeing what we were actually seeing. Well, Conservation International called it the most pristine, untouched place that they'd ever been in the Americas so far. Those are from game cameras. This is the area that we would walk across from our camp to go up to the site. Pumas, jaguars, other cats, huge herds of white-lipped peccaries. They said it was incredible. Species that they thought were, weren't present in Central America anymore. The number of species, endangered species that were there were incredible. The presence of all of the cats really indicates that it's an untouched place. The um, spider monkeys have a different color, the spider monkeys and the howler monkeys have a different coloration and patterning on them that may indicate that they're a new subspecies. Some of the Honduran ecologists think they might be a new species. And one unknown large species of mammal. We, we don't know. It's something about like a, like a, something like a raccoon. Uh, not a monkey. Uh, that would be awesome. But So wh wh what's next? Well, my work is continuing in Mexico, but we're also promoting s big scans in the Americas in threatened areas. And one of the places, where I can't tell you where it is, but we're looking for private money right now to do a big scan. We have permission to do a big scan in South America hopefully this summer. So we're going to continue our scanning work and scan, scan, scan as much as we possibly can. Thank you very much for sitting through all that. Do we retire to the chairs? I think so, yeah. Well, we have some time for some questions uh, from the audience. So there's a couple of folks with microphones to come around. And uh, anybody have a question for Dr. Fisher? How about here first? I'm curious, what kind of temperatures were you in in those jungles? So it's, you know, it's really strange when you're, you're kind of wet all the time. And it's fairly hot, but, and I have to preface this by saying I'm cold all the time. Like today, I could have been wearing a sweater outside. So 
most of the time, and you're, you're not in the direct sunlight. So, you know, like for example, when it rains, you hear it raining at the top of the tree, and then like 30 minutes it actually comes down and hits you. Uh, I mean, it's really pretty amazing. And actually, in some instances, it would rain, it would rain and we would be able to move out, take our time and leisurely move out into an open area and totally avoid the rain. So that's how, that's, how, uh, that's how much canopy is over the top of you. So I was cold all the time. I wore like a fleece, like most of the time. Uh, unless you walk out into the sun and then you're like, you know, very hot. Um, so the temperature is probably in the high 80s Fahrenheit, but you're, you're wet and you're kind of cold all the time. At least I was. Uh, so I was actually in your spring 2016 archaeology of death class. Um, and I remember the first two weeks of class, you're like, hey, we don't have class because I'm stuck in the jungle. Um, do you have any plans to go back to Honduras like in the near future? Or? So thank you for tolerating that. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, not, a, not to Honduras. It's just simply too dangerous. Uh, the logistical stuff is too dangerous. Um, the risk of getting a tropical disease is too dangerous. Um, politically, the country's not stable enough. But we will continue to work in Mexico um, and hopefully some other places in, in, the, in the Americas. So the field work continues. You, you commented that the, uh, the landscape is almost entirely human modified, which implies that the old growth forest is really not old growth forest, it's just 500 years old or something like that. Um, is there any data to indicate what, the, what the, uh, the, the ecology looked like before the Indians, if I can use that term, occupied the place and turned it into a, a, a megalopolis? Well, I'm, I mean, we don't know. So that's a really interesting question. And um, I, I also want to be very careful to, I, I mean, I think all of these tropical areas are really abandoned gardens. But I don't think that devalues you know, these places, right? Um, these are as old growth and as pristine as any place that you have in the Americas, right? So what was the landscape like before people actually got there? I mean, we have some idea about that. Certainly it's semi-tropical, but it was under a very different climatic. And so, and of course, we don't know when people got there, right? Um, sometime before 10, probably sometime before 12,000 years ago. But that's a, that, that date is a moving target, as many of you know who follow archaeology, because that date for the initial peopling of the Americas keeps getting pushed back. So when people did arrive in, in the Amazon, and a, a lot of us think that it was or Central America and, and the Amazon as well, and a lot of us believe that that was fairly early, um, they were occupying a landscape that existed in a different climatic regime. So it's entirely possible in the modern sort of last 10,000 years or so, the Holocene, or some people now call this the Anthropocene, that, that those landscapes co-evolved with people. And that was the normal condition for those landscapes. There's a couple of questions over here. Could you talk a little bit about the um issue with diseases, tropical diseases and parasites that you uh, were infected with and encountered down there? If that's not too difficult of art. No. Uh, so I was fortunate, I was unfortunate enough to, um, uh, con as many of us did, contract a parasite called leishmaniasis, which is, has a transmission vector that's very similar to malaria. So it's a protozoa that spends most, most of its time in small mammals or the gut of a sandfly. Sandfly is about half the size of a mosquito. It's like a noceum. Um, the sandfly, the protozoa, usually the normal reservoir for it is, is small mammals. It gets transferred to the gut of the sandfly when the sandfly bites the, um, takes a blood meal from the mammal. Um, that's where the protozoa has the best time of its life, in, this, in the gut of the sandfly. It, it fornicates there, that's where it mutates, it does all its stuff. And then it's transferred back into the mammal the next time that sandfly bites, bites the mammal or whatever. We happen to get in the way of that process. 
So leishmaniasis expresses itself um, in, in mammals as a, as a uh, uh, skin-eating lesion. So it's this flesh-eating parasite. So I contracted leishmaniasis. I actually had a bug bite that wouldn't heal, basically, uh, on the bottom of my foot, probably from sleeping and having, getting sand flies in my hammock or whatever. Um, the treatment is fairly heinous. You, get, you have to be treated at the NIH. It's the only place where you can really get effectively treated. They're the only ones so far that really know a lot about leishmaniasis. And they're interested in leishmaniasis because with global warming, it's moving northward. So a less virulent version of leishmaniasis than the kind that we got is actually already in Texas, Oklahoma, probably New Mexico, Arizona. Um, and it's moving north. Um, so the NIH, yeah, right. exactly. So the, NI, so, so the NIH is interested in figuring out how to treat it. Um, the treatment is, is fairly heinous. You get as many injections as you can stand of a fat lipid bonded with an um, uh, a, uh, antifungal drug. It's not a fungus, but it's, it, it's effective against it um, until you get very sick. Usually when you get your first injection, your body kind of freaks out because um, it doesn't know what, what this is that you're putting in it. And you usually get a pain somewhere. I experienced an incredibly intense pain in my lower back, it slowly migrated up to the middle of my back. It was the most intensive muscle contraction thing that I'd ever felt. And it took them about 10 minutes before they could get a little narcotic in my IV and then it kind of went away. I have it on the authority of the NIH doctors that what I experienced was the equivalent of one quarter of a birth contraction. <laughs> so, I can say with the authority of the NIH doctors that I'm one of the only males that knows what it's like to give birth. And it sucks. Um, so I was uh, curious. In the reconstruction, it looked like some terraced areas for agriculture. So I'm wondering if anyone's doing any modeling and if you could like reconstruct what the population was based on the amount of area that was under agriculture, like fields and things like that. Yeah. So and that's a great question. Most of those terraces that were in the immediate reconstruction area were actually habitation terraces. Not that they didn't have something that would be the equivalent of like a pretty, archaeologically we call them gardens. I think in modern terminology we might call them like a farmette or something. I mean it's a little more extensive than a garden. Um, I've been very careful and it is possible there is a methodology to reconstruct population. Archaeologists do that. I've been very careful not to do that <laughs> for the city of the Jaguar because we, don't, we know so little about that area and we know so little about the prehistory that any number that I throw out is just gonna be fairly erroneous. Um, but I think probably a, a fair number would be something between 10 and 15,000 people. I did just throw out a number. I'm uh, curious as to your, your exploration was very cursory but were you able to uh, ascertain in any way what the diet of these uh, inhabitants was uh, and possibly anything about the life of the people in general? Yeah, so these, these people probably were what we would archaeologically would, so they were eating um, probably some maize, but not a lot of maize. It's not a great maize growing area. What it's really, really good for growing is cacao. And, um, cacao or chocolate. Um, and cacao, this is one of the premier um, cacao growing areas even today. And I was, I did mention the chocolate bars. It's Casanova Chocolates in Florida. They actually are producing a boutique chocolate bar made from uh, sustainably grown 
cacao uh, made by indigenous producers in that, from that region. Uh, and it's called the Lost City Chocolate Bar. <laughs> and they're really good. <laughs> like, you should definitely get one. But probably, mostly what they were eating was, was probably manioc and other kind of forest crops like that. Um, tro basically a tropical kind of diet. They archaeologically would characterize these folks as a middle range society. Some people would say a chiefdom society. So they probably had a number of positions that were ranked. Power was potentially not inherited. But that's just a guess because we, we don't really know a lot about that, about that region. I have a couple questions. Uh, the first, uh, you were saying that land was being deforested for cattle. And then you showed a picture of a very steep mountainside that had be, uh, been deforested. Why would a steep mountainside be deforested? Second question would be um, uh, the um, ancient communities of Chaco Canyon are interconnected by an intricate trail system. Did you discover any trail system? And would LIDAR be able to discern a trail system? Yeah, so those are both good, those are both great questions. I had that same, I had that same question. This is so steeply forested. How could you run cattle up here? What, you know, why, why would they do this? But that's what they're doing. Um, they're so, people are so land poor. Uh, and the, a lot of the, the, incidentally, and something I didn't mention, is that a lot of the, the cattle raising is being financed by narco traficantes. So cattle are like a, a really uh, excellent way to, in case you're wondering, cattle are a really excellent way to launder money. And that's exactly what they're doing. And they hire folks that have no other means of income to go out and deforest these patches and, and bring, you know, give them cattle to raise and they bring the cattle back. Um, and then the second question was, I've forgotten the second question. Trails, yeah. There, so there are roadways that are noted for the area. And in T3, we do think that we see roadways. They're probably stone roadways. Um, and there is a reflectance that you get with the LiDAR. We can measure reflectance a little bit, intensity. And they have a very different intensity. So we do think that they're, they were stone roadways. But we didn't see any of that sort of stuff around um, uh, T1. But they're definitely noted for the area. And, you know, today you go to this place, you can be more disconnected from the 21st century. It's awesome. There's no internet, there's no cell phone, there's no power, I mean nothing, right? But, you know, in 1500, these people were completely connected to everybody. Um, and that would have been through a, a road system. Several times in the presentation, you talked about the incidence of d disease down there and how dangerous it was. How did the uh, indigenous people survive that in a, in a society uh, in, and maintain a reasonable economy? So most of the, so they, so the, the, the deadliest thing that we faced was, was the leishmaniasis. The, leash, the variety of leishmaniasis that we have is actually a, a hybrid between a Mexican variety and a Panamanian variety. Prehistorically, leishmaniasis was present in the Americas. There are even ceramics from South America and from the Amazon that show, and the, the kind of leishmaniasis that we have is mucosal. So it actually is, and I, somewhere I had a slide, I probably took it out, but um, it is a face-eating, flesh-eating, a face-eating uh, uh, protozoa. So if it goes untreated, it will eat the soft parts, like your nose. There are ceramics that show people without, without parts of their face from leishmaniasis. It's generally not as severe, though, as the kind that we have. And the incidence of infection is much lower, like maybe in the 10% kind of range. And it generally results in some kind of scar. It heals itself after about a year or so. The kind that we got is a mutation between the Mexican variety and the Panamanian variety. It's actually a new species. It's incredibly virulent, has like a 50% infection rate. 
based on the numbers of people that went into that place. Um, and it's really, really aggressive, which is why the NIH kind of strongly suggested that we get treated like immediately, right? Um, since it is a new species, it's unnamed. So I tried to convince the NIH folks that it should be called Leishmaniasis fisherensis. <laughs> My reasoning was that if I was ever at a dinner party or someplace and I was stuck for conversation, I could just turn to the person next to me and say, well, I have a flesh-eating protozoa named after me. <laughs> but I don't think they're going to go for it. If it gets a species name, it's going to be Hondurensis. But that, that, that variety of Leishmaniasis was not present um, when prehistoric peoples were there. And it wasn't the kinds that were there weren't as virulent. Also, the normal reservoir for that Leishmaniasis is small mammals. We don't know what, what the environment light was like or what species, what, the res what that reservoir was actually like in the prehistoric period. I think it was much smaller. So I think the prevalence of that, of the Leishmaniasis, was much lower. Yes. LIDAR is a, is a pretty good predictive tool to use with new technology. Where do you see LIDAR going? Do you see it evolving into something different, or what would you add to it to make it more productive? Well, LIDAR, the, what's, what's ha the trajectory of technological development for LIDAR now is smaller instrumentation, um, faster processing, and um, both of those things are resulting in many different kinds of LIDAR. So you can get, li eventually, you know, we'll be able to put LIDAR on drones and get the kind of resolution we need to do this kind of, the work that we're needing to do. And the drones will have the kind of um, range that we need. It, once we get LIDAR with the high <laughs> enough resolution onto a satellite, that's going to be a huge game changer. But of course, other kinds of LIDAR, terrestrial-based LIDAR and other things, are being used all the time. There's apps you can get for your phone now. Um, and the new 10 operating system has a kind of photogrammetry, LIDAR-esque thing that allows you to measure. I haven't actually seen it yet. I don't know how it works. And of course, self-driving cars use LIDAR. That's, how they, that's what they're using to map the area in front of them. So, so LIDAR is really, generally speaking, is, is fairly transformative. Um, I usually say LIDAR and the technologies that follow, right, to kind of save myself from. <laughs> so I have a two-part question for you, actually. The first is I was recently in the Bacalar area of southern Yucatan and was astounded because I would have entire afternoons by myself in some of the cities there. And so the first question is, do you have any plans to turn to that area? And secondly, do you ever take, say, um, artists or writers along with you to round out the process? Or not even round out, but to add to it? So I can't actually see where you are. If you could raise your hand. There, OK, thank you. Hi. It's weird. I can see. I don't know where the. Um, I, I don't work in, I haven't worked really in the Maya region. And I, a lot of people are using LIDAR in, in the Maya region. Um, there are a lot of Maya archaeologists. So I don't, I don't want to compete with them, or so I probably won't work in the lowlands at all. Um, sometimes we do. I took Doug Preston into the field, so Doug Preston's a writer, um, <laughs> uh, so I'm told. Um, but uh, I haven't taken. Some projects do take artists. We haven't taken an artist per se, but I'm not. I wouldn't discount the fact we we would. The place that would really be useful for us to have an artist would be in Mexico when we do excavation. Actually, I have two questions. Um, of all the artifacts that you brought back to, um, to Honduras that, left, that you left there, what was the most significant learning you uh, received from studying those uh, artifacts? So you can go from both of my questions now, or do you want me to just answer that one? And my second question was, does LIDAR work over the ocean? Are they using that in the oceans as well? So I'll answer the last one first. There is a shallow water kind of LIDAR that can be used. Um, and it should be being, for archaeology, should be for, 
for, uh, it has a lot of potential to be used for like shallow water shipwrecks and stuff like that. Uh, and ecologists are actually using it to study like uh, uh, underwater, shallow underwater grasses and things like that. Um, it's kind of in a prototype sort of phase. The issue is any particulate matter in the water will also send back a signal. So the water has to be really, really clear, but you know, as that instrument becomes more sophisticated, it will. The main thing we learned about the artifacts that, that we were able to excavate was their spatial arrangement. They were, they were all arranged around artifacts of three different kinds of motifs. There were vultures, um, which are the largest kind of power raptor bird in, in this area, and they're brilliantly colored. They're amazing looking animals. And, um, Throughout South America and Central America, and even into the Maya region, there's a lot of vulture iconography. Were jaguar, which is like, if, you know, um, if you thought a werewolf wasn't terrifying enough, there's the were, were jaguar. Uh, and were jaguar, again, is a, common, is a uh, common motif that occurs in that same sort of area. These are all big spirit uh, shaman things. Um, and then the third figure is a little debated. Um, some people say that it's a trickster monksty, monkey figure. I actually think that it's, uh, it represents a dead ancestor, or a dead person. So you're tying yourself to that sort of realm. And those objects were at the center of the cache. And then those seats of power, which some people call matates, they look like bantates, like mono matate from, like, say, Mexico, but they're not actually matates, they're actually seats. And one way that you show your eliteness in the Americas is by not sitting on the ground. Common people sit on the ground. So elites sit on stools. And those stools are arranged around those central objects as if that is, you know, like the last council meeting or the last meeting at that place. Um, and some of those objects are ritually broken. So they actually, it's like breaking the spirit desanctifying the city probably when it was abandoned. I think we're coming to the end of our time. Maybe one more question. Uh, you've mentioned a few times that you're in the minority and thinking that these were abandoned gardens. What's the prevailing thought? Well, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. Uh, you mentioned a few times that you're in the minority and thinking that these oh. are abandoned gardens. So what is the prevailing thought? There's, a, there's an old trope in anthropology, it goes back to like the 1920s even, that in a tropical environment you couldn't support a true civilization because all of the energy is held, all of the energy in that system is held in the biomass. The soils are, tropical soils are typically very thin, um, so they can't really support, the, the thinking was that they can't support like a, a large population. Right? And once you remove the vegetation, once you remove the biomass, you've taken all the energy out of the system. So there were a lot of people that believed, until fairly recently actually, that you couldn't have a true civilization. You couldn't in, in, in tropical environments. Which of course we now know is completely absurd, right? Um, Anchor Wat, the Maya, I mean what's happening in the Amazon, even the Mosquitia work. Um, so if you have those large populations, how do you support them? And that has, there's a whole line of inquiry in archeology span of people that actually look for those ancient agricultural features and those managed, engineered landscapes that those things are embedded in. And earlier in my career, the pre-LIDAR phase of my career, which Sounds silly, but I, there is a pre-LIDAR phase when I did my dissertation. And that, that was all focused on a lot of that human environment kind of connection. So there's a, there's a school of people that is growing that is suggesting that all of the Americas was completely engineered like that. And um, increasingly, any place people look or any place that people, any, you know, when they pursue that line of inquiry, um, they find these incredible engineered uh, environments. 
Amazing. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thanks. For Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks.